If you have played D&D or similar tabletop RPGs, you have likely come across puzzles. You can find them in dungeons and in the creepy crypts that had to go to retrieve some kind of book from, or even in the basement of a wine cellar. But how do you actually make them? Like where do you begin? How do you start? How do you figure out the mechanics and such? I've been DMing for a little over 10 years and I've always struggled a bit with puzzles. Usually when I need some, I just basically copy paste them from some board module or something like that. And the few times that I've actually made them myself, they have not been super satisfying. So I sat myself down and gave this a lot of thought and I have come up with a method that I think is both solid, but also creatively engaging. The first part requires us to understand what a puzzle actually is and what it can do for us. So with no further ado, let us get into it. At its core, a puzzle is two things. First of all, it's an obstacle. And secondly, it's a fun activity. Now, this might sound obvious, but it's important to keep in mind when we start to create a puzzle because maybe we have this grand idea of the puzzle where we want some elements that the players can experiment with and we want some nice aesthetics and just all this mishmash of ideas. And this is basically trying to make the puzzle from the outside and go like even. Instead, we want to try to go to the core of the puzzle and let it grow organically from within. So keep that in mind. The puzzle is supposed to be an obstacle and it's also supposed to be fun. Now I want to introduce a concept which might sound a little bit silly and gimmicky, but bear with me, it will make sense further down the line. And the concept is the level of obstacleness. Basically, the level of obstacleness is a measure of how difficult the puzzle is to solve. How likely is it that the players will get stuck on it? So let's imagine a very simple puzzle. We have a door that only opens when you say a specific password. There's no other way to get through. This puzzle, if we can call it that, has a very high level of obstacleness. Because there's only one solution. If the players don't figure out the password, they will not be able to get through. On the other hand, the same puzzle, we could allow someone to pick the lock or just kick in the door with a hand apparently, or use the knock spell. This means that there are more ways to get through the puzzle and that lowers the level of obstacleness. Now of course you can say that picking the lock isn't really solving the puzzle, it's more like bypassing the puzzle, and I agree. But the level of obstacleness only cares about how likely it is for the party to get through because we are going to use the level of obstacleness when we balance the puzzle. We need to think about what the puzzle actually guards. If it is for example guarding the progress of the story, maybe the party is in a dungeon and they need a certain item to afford the adventure, they don't want to get stuck on a puzzle. Therefore we need the puzzle to have a low level of obstacleness. You can't see my hands down here low level of obstacleness. On the other hand, if the puzzle is only guarding like an optional treasure, like a magical sword or some gold, you can raise the level of obstacleness. Because it doesn't matter if the party doesn't get through the puzzle, if they do, it's good, they get a reward, everyone is happy. If they don't, they can just move on. The second core feature, that it is a fun activity, we will try to keep in mind when we are done with the first draft of the puzzle. We can stand back and take a look at it and ask ourselves, is this, <laughs> is this puzzle actually fun? Does it look fun? If the answer is yes, then we can move on. If the answer is no, then we can ask ourselves, how do we make it more fun? So keep in mind, the puzzle needs to be an obstacle. Keep in mind the level of obstacleness, And also keep in mind at some point that the puzzle needs to be fun. Now that we keep in mind what a puzzle is, we can ask ourselves the next question. Why do we want a puzzle in the first place? What can they do for us? Why do we even bother with them? Let's investigate that in the second part. There are a few reasons why we want puzzles in our dungeons, apart from having some fun activity for the players that is different from combat or diplomatic situations and that kind of stuff. One of them is that puzzles can work as an amplifier for theme and the setting. Like, imagine you have a dungeon that is the lair of a famous illusionist. You can 
show this by having torches that are illusionary, like they cast light but no heat. And you can have illusions in the artwork and the decor of the dungeon. But in order to really make the theme of illusions pop, you could have a puzzle that is centered around illusions. Like really having the players work with illusions. It will just make the theme more tangible and probably more memorable as well. Another thing that puzzles can amplify is the importance of certain objects. For example, if you need to give the players a certain MacGuffin as part of the story, having the MacGuffin hidden behind a puzzle will make it feel more important. It tells the players that someone has spent time and effort to protect this item, so that just means that it must be important, at least more important than if it was just lying in some chest or part of the loot that you get from the final boss. You'll get bonus points if you also theme the puzzle around the MacGuffin itself. Use it as an opportunity to impart information like the properties of the MacGuffin or the history of it or something similar. So solving the puzzle not only makes the MacGuffin feel more important because it's protected, they also learn about it in the process. It's really good. <laughs> it's the power of puzzles. Another thing that puzzles can do is impart information or cement knowledge that the players already have. For example, the players might be infiltrating the lair of a famously crafty assassin. And part of that process is solving a puzzle where the players need to identify various poisons. And this tells the players something about the methods of the assassin that they are chasing. Or you could have a puzzle that incorporates the gods from your homebrew pantheon and that way kind of like making the players aware of the names of the gods and their alignments and such. Maybe they need to arrange them in their different relations or like their history or something. And like working with this knowledge will make it easier to remember. Of course, when you have a puzzle where the players need specific information in order to solve the puzzle, it's a good idea, if not a requirement, to have that information available nearby. For example, maybe in a library that is attached to the dungeon, or maybe there's this ancient ghost that can tell some hints or part of the story, and then the players have to take all that information and use it in the puzzle, and that sort of like cements it in their mind, hopefully. A great example of such a puzzle is the first puzzle in the Tomb of Annihilation, the puzzle that grants access to the tomb itself. Basically, the players have to arrange the nine trickster guards into a way where they oppose each other in this pattern. And the information for how to solve this is available in a nearby gallery. Uh, so they have the information, and by solving this puzzle, when they get into the tomb, they know about the trickster guards. They know their names, they know their appearances, and they know their internal relationships. So it's sort of like just a way to refresh that knowledge that they received earlier, so they go into the tomb with it, like, ready at hand. It's really great. <laughs> so if all this talk has really sold you on the idea of puzzles, and you really want to go in there and start to make puzzles and put them in your dungeons and amplify the theme and the story and make the players remember your entire backstory for your, for your setting, it's finally time to actually talk about how to make a puzzle. Before we do anything, we want to think about the theme of the puzzle. For example, take the illusionist's layer that I mentioned earlier. If we put our puzzle in this, we want the theme to be illusions. Or if the puzzle takes place in like some kind of temple on the elemental plane of fire, we should probably have fire as the theme of the puzzle. But it doesn't have to be that fantastical. If the puzzle is set in like a carpenter's workshop, the theme could be everyday objects. We're going to use the theme in some of the following steps, so for now, just keep it in mind. I have written quite a few stories in my time, and I kind of like to think of puzzles as stories on their own. They start when the players encounter the puzzle and begin to figure out what they're up against. It proceeds with them trying to solve the puzzle, and then it ends with them either solving the puzzle in triumph or in defeat, and they have to turn around or find some other way around it. And one of the methods that I've come across for making stories, I think can also be used for making puzzles. The idea is basically that you start at the end and then you begin to work your way towards the beginning. That way, 
everything you do will always point towards the end and you're less likely to run into dead ends in the process. So let's start making the puzzle. The first step is to ask ourselves how do we imagine the puzzle will be solved. This is the end of the puzzle and if we can figure that out we can begin to work our way backwards towards the beginning of this little story we are creating. It could be something as simple as the players opening a door, maybe they find a key or they learn a password and this will allow them to pass through this passage. It could also be something like putting statues in a certain arrangement that will open the door or something like that. This is the first creative step, so take your time to think of some options. We basically want a list of available solutions that we can then pick the one we like the most from. I'm going to make a sample puzzle along the explanation of the method. So for this purpose I'm going to go with the door that is unlocked by saying a password. That is the solution to our puzzle. This is the final scene, if you will, of our story. You might have noticed that this step involves asking a question about our puzzle. And it's basically what we're going to do in every other step. Now we have asked a question, how does the puzzle end? And we have our answer by saying a password to a door. This allows us to ask more questions. Questions like, how do the players find the password? And how do the players know that they need to say a password? So that's two questions that we can then answer in the same way and that will begin to grow the puzzle backwards. Let's start with the first question. How do the players find the password? We will try to find a few options and then pick the one we like the most. So the first option could be that the password is hidden in a sequence of other words and the players need to figure out which word stands out in order to find the password. Another option could be that they need to find the sequence of letters and basically spell out the password. Or a third option could be that the password is the name of a certain spell or historical person. Of course there are more options than this, but for the sake of brevity I'm going to stick with these three. I'm going to go with the first option, which means that the players need to find a word in a sequence of words and uh, sort of figure out which one stands out. Next question. How do the players know that they need to say a password in the first place? Again, we find a list of options and we try to pick the one we like the most. One option could be that there's simply a text above the door that states that the players need to order a password in order to get through. Another option is that when the players are heading to the dungeon, they could encounter some kind of local guide or something that tells them that in this dungeon, there's a door that only opens when a secret word is spoken. And uh, that will let them know when they get to this door that this is probably where they need to say a password. A third option could be that there's like a journal lying on the floor close to the door with some scribbles from a previous adventurer that says that they know that they need to speak a password but they couldn't figure it out or something like that. Uh, again, passing on the information to the players that they need to say a password in order to get through. I'm just gonna go with the second option because I kind of like the foreshadowing. Like even before they get to the dungeon, they get some knowledge about it. It's kind of, I like that. I like foreshadowing. So we have a puzzle that is solved by saying a password. The players find the password by finding the odd word out of a sequence of words. And they know they need to say the password because they've been told by some stranger on the way to the dungeon. That allows us to ask the next question. How do the players actually find the odd one out? This is where it's a good idea to remember the theme of the dungeon. Now we didn't choose one, but I'm going to go with the illusion dungeon that we talked about already. So the theme of the dungeon is illusions. So the way the players find the odd word out should probably involve some kind of illusionary stuff. So again, like with the other questions, we will try to find some options and take the one we like the most. One option could be that in the room there are five objects and one of them is an illusion and figuring out which one is the illusion gives you the password. A second option could be five statues where four of them are holding illusionary objects and creating an illusion of the fifth object that fits whatever the statue is doing will make it speak the password. Again, you can think of more options than this. The more you think of, the better. I usually find that the more you try to find more options, the more interesting they become. Personally, I like both of them, but I feel the first option requires more like work with the illusions instead of just creating an illusion. 
So we're gonna go with that one. We have five objects in the room. One of them is an illusion. Figuring out which one is the illusion will give you the password. Now new questions arise. Which five objects are in the room? And how do we make identifying an illusion more complex than simply putting a hand through the objects and seeing which one is not real? The answer to the first question kind of depends on the second one, so let's start with that. How do we make it more complex to identify an illusion than simply testing it with your hand? One option is to make the illusion out of reach, like we can put it on a high ledge or at a distance, or maybe have it locked behind a barrier made of glass or iron bars or something like that. A second option is that we can make touching the objects potentially dangerous, so we put a price on like trying to brute force the puzzle by just using your hands. A third option is that we can make the illusion so realistic that even using your hands is not enough to test it. Sort of like the Phantasmal Force spell. This might seem a little bit arbitrary perhaps, but again remember that this is the dungeon of a famous, powerful illusionist. So we can go a little crazy with illusions here and there. For the sake of this example, I'm going to go with option two that the objects that the players are investigating could be potentially dangerous. And this gave me an idea of what the answer to question number one could be, which is what objects are they actually investigating. So in this puzzle, the players will be investigating damage types. Imagine there are five jars and one contains fire, one contains like noxious fumes, one is covered with rime on the inside from the cold, one has this bubbling acidic liquid in it, and then one is just like containing a continuous like arc of lightning. So you have fire, cold, acid, poison, and uh, lightning damage? Is that a thing? Was it thunder damage? I think it's lightning. <laughs> I've played D&D for 10 years. So now the players can just try to brute force the puzzle and put the hand into the jars and test which one is real, but it's gonna have a price. If you put your hand into the flames, you gotta get burned. If you put your hand into the acid, you're gonna get dissolved. And this means that you can solve the puzzle fairly easily, but at a price. So a player could of course be very lucky and put the hand into the right jar in the first try and realize that the lightning is the illusion. Easy say the word lightning and the door will open. But alternatively, they can be very unlucky and have to try four jars first. I kind of think this is fine that you have this random element of how much they need to pay in terms of damage to get through the puzzle. So that, that fits me perfectly. <laughs> I like that. Now a more clever character might think of trying to test the damage types in a more uh, safe way. For example, by putting a stick into the fire and see if it burns. But of course, putting a stick into noxious fumes is probably not gonna change the stick at all. And uh, maybe the lightning won't really affect the stick either. So solving the puzzle becomes sort of finding the right objects to test the illusions with, which is, again, fine. That is one solution. Use your hand or find suitable objects. There are options. And then other solutions present themselves. Maybe you have a character that can cast detect magic and they can see that there's an aura of illusionary magic on one of the jars and that will reveal which one is the illusion. Or maybe there's a character that is really clever and cunning who will investigate them and uh, determine that the lightning seems a little bit weird. Or maybe someone would just go straight to the core of the problem, look at the different words and just try them out at the door. I mean, that's just five words. You can try that out, walk up to the door and say fire, lightning, acid, and so on, until one of them opens the door. Again, we can put a price on this, maybe saying fire, which is not the right word in this example, will make fire burst down and punish the character for trying the wrong word. And again, this allows you to basically brute force the puzzle, but at a price. Now, all these various ways to solve the puzzle lowers the level of obstacleness for our puzzle. And that's great if we want to use the puzzle to block progress to the story. But if we want to increase the level, we can do that by changing a few things. But we will look into that when we customize the puzzle in a moment. For now, 
this is the puzzle that we're made. The players approach the dungeon. They are told by a local tavern keeper that the dungeon has a certain door where you need to say a specific word in order to pass through. The players then enter the dungeon and they do indeed find a door that does not open to a push or a shove. There's no keyhole and they realize this is probably the door where they need to say a word. In the same room there are five pedestals upon which sits five jars. Each jar has a different kind of damage in them. One is full of flames, one is cold with frost, one has a bubbling acid liquid in it, one has noxious fumes and one has just this continuous arc of lightning going on. For clarity's sake, each of the jars have a little plaque underneath it that says, for example, fire, cold, acid and so on to make it obvious what the word for this specific jar is. The players use the various options that they have at hand and uh, they figure out that the, the jar with the lightning in it is different. Maybe someone is clever enough to study them and see that the lightning repeats in a certain way that is artificial or someone just sticks their hand into the jars and tests them until they have found the one that doesn't hurt. They say the word and the door opens and the puzzle is solved. That's our first draft of the puzzle. In the next section, we are gonna try to customize it to change the level of obstacleness and also change the aesthetics a little bit. Maybe make it a little bit more interesting. So let us move on to the part of that. There are basically two ways we can customize our puzzles. The first one is fiddling with the level of obstacleness and the second one is the aesthetics. Starting with the level of obstacleness, we can ask ourselves what the purpose of the puzzle is. What is it blocking access to? We could say that this puzzle is blocking access to story progression, so the players need to get through this dungeon in order to forward the story. In that case, we want a low level of obstacleness. In that regard, I think our puzzle already has a crucial aspect when it comes to blocking progress. It is possible to bypass it. Maybe the players cannot find the proper solution by other means, but they can always pay a price equal to the bad luck by just putting their hands into the jars. Eventually, they will find the right one and they will move on and the puzzle will never break the game or the story. But still, we can make it a little bit more difficult without changing the level of obstacleness too much. For example, if we don't like the idea of someone just casting Detect Magic and then finding the one jar that has an a magical aura, we could put an effect on all the jars akin to the Nistel's magic aura spell, basically making each jar give off an aura of illusion magic. And then maybe we don't like the idea of a character just walking up, doing a good investigation check and realizing that this is the jar that is containing an illusion. We could just raise the DC for the check or we could make the illusion indistinguishable from the actual damage types. It could be something like the Phantasmal Force spell that gives it tactility and such. But again, remember this is the dungeon of a powerful illusionist. So maybe the illusion is just so powerful that it is indistinguishable. This solution might be a little bit cheap, but if it leads to a more engaging solution to the puzzle, I think it's worth it. At the end of the day, if it's more fun, then you win. You can do more with the level of obstacleness if that's what you want. But I think this is fine for now, so we will move on to the aesthetics. We decided that the solution to the puzzle is speaking a password, which will open a door, but maybe we can find a more theme appropriate way to block passage than just a door. Say for example that the players are faced with this chasm, and there are columns that they can use to jump across the chasm. However, some of these columns are illusionary, which makes a trial and error approach quite dangerous. So speaking the right password will remove the fake columns and reveal the safe way across. Again, if you want to avoid someone just casting the tech magic, you can use the Nistel's magic aura trick. Or we can stick with the door, but instead of just saying a password, the players need to conjure an illusion of the right element in the hands of a statue or something like that. And that will open the way just a little more theme appropriate way to 
solve the puzzle. Now, you could do more with the aesthetics if you want to. A puzzle is sort of like a piece of art, if you will. You can always tweak it, always add to it or fine tune it however you want. It's basically done when you think it's done. For the sake of this video, I'm going to say this puzzle is done because I want to use this method again and create a second puzzle uh, to sort of show the method in action in a more rapid way and give you a better sense of how it works in practice. Let us move to the final section where I make another sample puzzle to show the method in action. Now let's try to make a sample puzzle. The first step is to think of the theme, where is our puzzle placed? In this example, let's say it is in some kind of water temple, so the theme is water. Next, we ask the question, how is the puzzle solved? Uh, we can think of a very simple solution, like a key unlocks the door. Think of this like a sort of placeholder, in case we get a better idea while we're doing the process. Then we have the following questions. How do the players get the key? And how do they know that they need a key? The second question is fairly simple. We could just put a keyhole on the door and it should be pretty self-evident. But again, you could spend more time to think of other solutions that are maybe more interesting than this. The first question, however, is a bit more intriguing. How do the players get the key? We will find some options and pick the one that we like. The first option could be that the players need to take the key from a hard to reach place. A second option could be that the key is made through solving the puzzle. Maybe there's like a mold and they need to put water into it and freeze it to make this ice key that will work. Or maybe there's like several pieces for mold and putting it together the right way will allow them to cast a key the same way. The third option could be that the key is in fact the friends that we made. Now option two sounds pretty intriguing but it's basically a puzzle of its own. It basically makes itself. So in order to showcase this method a bit better I'm going to go with the first option which is that the key is in a hard to reach place and solving the puzzle is about finding a way to get the key. This leads us to the question how do we make it difficult to reach? Let us think about the theme and think about the properties of water in this case. So what are the properties of water? One, it can freeze solid or evaporate into a gas. Two, things can float on it or sink through it. Three, air breathing creatures could potentially drown in it. Four, it conducts electricity. Five, it can be scooped up and moved around. And six, it flows downwards if given the option. Looking at these properties gives us some options. Let's say that the key is at the bottom of a pit lying on a board of wood and filling the pit with water will float the key to the surface and allow the players to grab it. But that raises some more questions. What prevents the players from simply jumping into the pit or climbing down and just grabbing the key without even thinking about water? And where do the players get the water from? The second question is probably the easiest to answer, so let's go with that one first. Let's think of some options for getting the water. One option could be that there was a pool of water in the beginning of the temple with some decorative jars that suddenly get some special meaning now that the players remember. We could bring water from that pool. A second option could be that one of the players have the create or destroy water spell, and if they don't, maybe there could be some kind of magical item that will allow them to make a similar effect. A third option is that there could be some channels with running water in the temple that can be redirected and until now the players have just thought they were decorative but they gain a new purpose as they realize uh, the nature of this puzzle. Number one and three are pretty good options in my opinion so let's go with option one. Now this leaves us with a question of how we ensure that the players actually need the water to solve the puzzle. This is the department of the level of obstacleness and at the moment the, if we just leave the puzzle as it is, it's going to be very low. I mean, you can just jump in, grab the key and get out. And that might necessarily not be a bad thing, but we will try to increase the level a little bit. We can start by making the pit 30 feet deep, which means that simply jumping into the pit is going to have a cost of broken bones, depending on the level of the characters. Of course, you might have a cast that they can cast Mage Hand, that we can just reach down and grab the key. So we make the pit 35 feet deep. 
This means that Mage Hand is still a viable option, but the caster will need to find some way to lower themselves a bit into the pit before they can do it, which creates a little bit of a dangerous situation. With a robe and some strong party members, maybe a character can just climb down into the pit and grab the key that way safely. Uh, so let's put a grate on top of the pit. In this case, we might have a small character like a halfling that will be rewarded for their size by being able to squeeze through the bars and make this descent. Or we can reward a barbarian with allowing them to simply rip the grate apart and that way gain access. Or not, we could say that the grate is made of adamantium and rule out that option. We could also just leave the pit open and just let it be very inviting but then fill it with traps. Maybe there are very obvious handholds that you can use to get down into the pit, but 10 feet down, the handholds trigger a trap where the handholds will disappear, dropping the character into the pit. Maybe the bottom of the pit is just one big pressure plate, which when triggered, will begin to fill the pit with water. Yes, good, but also electrified eels. So sort of solving the puzzle, but at a cost. Personally, I like the idea of having a grate over the pit because it sort of like emphasizes the need to bring the key to the players instead of the players trying to get to the key. And so here we have it. The players enter a temple dedicated to some kind of water goddess. Near the entrance, they find a pool of water with these very beautiful decorative jars. Further inside the dungeon, they come across a door that needs a key to be unlocked. And down in this pit covered with a grate of adamantium they see there's a key lying on this wooden board. They maybe realize that they can bring the water from the front of the temple using the jars fill in the pit and let the board and the key float up to them so they can reach down and grab the key. Maybe they have some spell that it will allow them to conjure water, fill up the pit and that way get the key. Maybe the idea of water doesn't even cross their mind and they simply break apart the uh, the grade with some creative method, however they can think of. Maybe they just pick the lock, depending on how important this puzzle is. Maybe the puzzle just blocks access to some optional magical item that they don't really need, which means that we can increase the level of obstacleness. So the door cannot be picked. It is too magical to be opened by such mere means. The grade cannot be removed. They have to solve the partial the partial. <laughs> they have to solve the puzzle in the intended way, sort of, within reason. And maybe they do, maybe they get the key to them, they open the door and unlock the chest that contains the uh, the water sort of the seven magiques. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. That's the puzzle. It's fairly different from the first one, I think. Uh, there's a lot of physical interactions in this one where the other one relied more on investigation perhaps and of course you can customize this however you like and this was made very quickly the more time you spend on it you can find more interesting options for each step but this is the basics of it the method put very simply is start from the end and ask questions about each step going backwards until you reach an entry point keep in mind the theme of the place that the puzzle is set in as this will help you find the answers to some of the questions that you ask. And when you're done with the first draft, you can always change things around, make them more interesting, make them more theme appropriate. You can increase the difficulty, you can lower the difficulty if you realize this puzzle is too hard for what it is actually guarding. And that's it. That is a way to make puzzles. I hope you find this method useful and you can use it to add some intrigue and some fun to your dungeons. And if you watched this far, I thank you a lot. It's been fun to create this video and I hope to make more of them. If you want to support this whole endeavor, you can give the video a like and maybe subscribe to the channel. And uh, comments go a long way as well, so why don't you maybe write about some of your puzzle creations down in the comment section. This is the end and I will see you in the next one, so until then take care and uh, see you. Hand waving. <laughs> <laughs>